The military is of great importance in Isayama's attack on Titan. That's to be expected in a story that's so political and war-centric. However, before the politics of the show really took off, we have always seen one faction of the military enjoy the spotlight from the very first episode to the very last. This faction is the Survey Corps, which Eren desperately wanted to join since the very beginning. In a world where humans are like birds in cages in the face of invincible titans, we find our ray of hope in the existence of Levi Ackerman. Known as humanity's strongest, Levi proves himself to be worthy of his title over and over again, as he shows us how, in this war against titans, he is the predator, and the giant monsters are his prey. The concept of show don't tell also has a great impact on storytelling, but with Levi, not only does Isayama tell us he's great, he goes on to show us how Levi is unmatched. But what makes him unmatched? Why is he humanity's strongest? We'll get down to the details in this very video. Who is Levi Ackerman? How did he join the Survey Corps? A boy born in the underground city within the walls, Levi spent a whopping majority of his life without knowing the slightest thing about his lineage as an Ackerman. His mother, Kuchel, was a prostitute working in the underground and conceived Levi after being impregnated by one of her clients. Naturally, Levi lived without a father. One day, his uncle Kenny came to visit his younger sister, but soon realized that she had died from illness. Near the bedside, Kenny found a young and malnourished Levi and decided to raise him. Levi here was not aware of Kenny being his uncle as it was not revealed to him. However, from him, Levi learned how to wield a knife and acquired a violent demeanor at an early age. One day, Kenny witnessed Levi start a fight and win it with great ease. He then realized that he had taught Levi all the skills his nephew needed to survive in the harsh world and abandoned him. Needless to say, Levi went on to resent Kenny for this and never considered him to be a good father figure. As he grew up, he became a criminal and started taking up odd and illegal jobs for money. The people of the underground city had a harder life than the surface dwellers as many people would acquire health problems due to the lack of sunlight. Many people lived out their lives without ever going to the surface. There were stairs that did take people to the land above, and it was mostly used by the merchants of the city and guarded by people who used to charge absurd amounts of money as a toll. Failure to pay got one hunted down. However, Levi and his partner Furland somehow managed to get their hands on the vertical maneuvering equipment that the Survey Corps and the military police used. A young girl named Isabel went on to join their unit, and although Levi always showed off a cold demeanor, he did care a fair amount for Furlan and Isabel. Together, the three of them would use the ODM gear to get work done around the underground and survive in the harsh environment. Throughout all of this, it is made very evident that Levi is highly capable as a fighter and has been unrivaled by whoever has opposed him or those he has opposed. At some point, he and his crew were hired by Irwin Smith's political enemies from the surface to steal some incriminating documents about Smith. In return, they were promised that they would get paid handsomely and acquire surface residency in the royal capital within the walls. However, it is not long until the military men come to the underground, trying to hunt them down. Levi, Furlan, and Isabel attempt to escape using their vertical maneuvering equipment, but Levi is quick to realize that their chasers are not the military police, but the Survey Corps. The likes of Irwin Smith and Mike Zacharias were part of the chase as well, so the fight was going to be a tough one for Levi. Being far stronger than the average person, Levi was able to hold his own, but Isabel and Furlan had been captured. This forced Levi to surrender. Irwin went on to comment on the three of them having great skills with the vertical maneuvering equipment. Levi was then given an ultimatum. The three of them could either be handed over to the military police or they could join the Survey Corps. Reluctantly, Levi chose the latter. In short, Levi landed in the Survey Corps against his will, but things weren't merry with Irwin at first. Levi continued to have no intentions of enlisting and wished to get closer to Irwin and kill him. The trio were trained to kill Titans, and Levi shows immense aptitude from the very beginning. After an expedition outside, they still continued to search for the incriminating documents on Irwin, but didn't manage to find anything. A storm broke out the next day, but while Levi headed off to deal with the document business by himself, Isabel and Furlan got taken out by a random pure Titan. Levi returned quickly after noticing Titan footprints and realized that he was too late to save his friend. In a fit of rage, Levi ruthlessly took out all the Titans. When he saw Irwin next, he attacked the commander, only to learn that the incriminating documents Levi was searching for were fake, and that the real ones were already in the hands of the commander-in-chief. In the end, Irwin managed to explain how the deaths of Isabel and Furlan were not Levi's fault, and that he should stay and fight as part of the Corps. This becomes a key moment that affects Levi's personality, and he doesn't catch a break from losing his comrades throughout the show. 
However, the one thing that motivates Levi is not the desire to avenge them or the greater concept of freedom, but the need to not let the death of his comrades go to waste. Is Levi's anatomy closer to a human or a titan? Why? From the first season itself, Levi is introduced and referred to as humanity's strongest. He is often said to be as strong as an entire brigade. Now, a brigade mostly has somewhere between 1,500 to 5,500 people in it. For a mere human to match the strength of so many by themselves is unnatural. In fact, we don't get an explanation behind Levi's absurd strength for the longest time. We see him pull off feats like taking out hordes of pure titans one after the other, almost taking out an female titan, which is significantly superior to the average titan, and getting caught in the crossfire of Kenny and his squad's attack at the beginning of Season 3 and emerging victorious. Eventually, the truth about the Ackerman family is revealed, and on the verge of death, Kenny reveals that Kuchel was his sister. With this, Levi learns that Kenny Ackerman and Levi Ackerman are related. So why is being an Ackerman such a big deal? Prior to the formation of this life within the walls, the Eldian Empire used to rule over the world with the power of titans. At some point, Point, they had dabbled with using Titan science on humans for experiments. An accidental result led to the creation of the Ackerman bloodline which went on to become a lineage of super soldiers. Due to their enhanced abilities, they became the right hand of the Eldian crown. This is also what allows Levi, Mikasa, and Kenny to be so absurdly overpowered compared to the other humans. We see the story dive into the details about the royal family within the walls and its shenanigans during the Uprising arc. This is also where we learn the truth about the Ackerman clan. Both Levi and Mikasa attest to having experienced a weird surge of strength during key moments that put them in fight or flight situations which is referred to as the awakening of the Ackerman instinct. While Mikasa describes it as gaining total control over her body, Levi explains it as knowing exactly what to do. He even says that it is something Kenny has experienced as well. We do witness Mikasa's awakening sometime in the sixth episode of Attack on Titan. One key takeaway from the moment is how during her awakening, yellow lightning surged from within Mikasa's body and brain. When a Titan transforms, the transformation is depicted with a surge of external yellow lightning, similar to the one happening within Mikasa. She tells us that in both cases, the powers are gained from the power of Titans. This means that Levi is so disgustingly strong only because he has access to the power of the Titans. However, the Ackermans cannot turn into Titans even if the Titan serum is injected into their systems, and this is because they already have the power of the Titans. So in terms of anatomy, Levi is closer to a human than a Titan because he can't turn into a Titan. In terms of power, he's closer to a Titan than a human. But even anatomically, Ackermans are much more durable with bodies that can exert and withstand a lot more pressure than the average human. What advantages does Levi's bloodline give him? Can he connect to the past? Being an Ackerman gives one access to superhuman strength, speed, endurance, agility, durability, and senses. When an Ackerman finds themselves in a situation where they have to fight back but can't, they awaken their dormant ability and, via the paths, gain access to their aforementioned powers. One more thing about the paths and the titans. We know that shifters can gain the memories of past wielders of their titans via the paths. Something similar is experienced by the Ackermans as well. They don't gain the memories of their ancestors, but they do gain all of their cumulative battle experiences. Due to them having been super soldiers who used to serve the king for generations, it has always been quite common for an Ackerman to live a life full of violence and action. Hence, the awakening is something that gives one total control over their bodies, and they know exactly what it is they have to do. But what truly sets an Ackerman apart from the rest of the subjects of Ymir would be the fact that despite having access to the paths and being able to be affected by the powers of founder Ymir, their memories cannot be altered, removed, or toyed with. After Eldia segregated itself from the world it oppressed, Carl Fritz, as the founding titan, used the founder's powers to harden colossal titans and create the walls. Then, he made the populace within the walls forget about the history of the world outside. The people exempt from this were the other members of the royal family, who would generally be kept aware of the truth, the Ackermans, some of the noble clans, and the Oriental clan. However, unlike the other clans or families here, the Ackermans were extremely powerful, and their immunity to the mind alteration made them dangerous. Matters got worse when they began to revolt against the royal family for concealing the truth of the world from the people, and the Ackermans stopped serving Fritz. To counter any possible damage, the crown put out a hit on the clan. 
leading the Ackermans to nigh extinction. This is why we see Levi and Mikasa being unaware of why they are so strong and what it is that makes them so strong. However, Levi is unaware of the truth of the world also because the clan massacre led to the surviving Ackermans not passing down the knowledge of the outside world to their children, which led to the information being lost with the modern generation of Ackermans. Because many of them had taken shelter in unlikely places, such as the mountains and the underground city, Levi grew up in the underground, despite his ancestors having served the crown. To top this off, the extermination led to the Ackerman-run businesses being destroyed, which is why Levi was poor during his early years. His connection to the paths is the reason why Levi is highly capable as a fighter from the get-go. He did train with and under Kenny and acquire a fair bit of his own experience, and yet that would not be enough for him to have a track record with little to no losses, especially since he goes on to fight Titans after meeting Erwin. But him acquiring the battle experiences of his ancestors is what allows him to mostly enjoy a smooth run when it comes to fighting. In terms of abilities, Levi has several impossible feats up his arsenal, which no human could execute unless they belong to the Ackerman family. In Season 1, Levi is able to fidget, spin, and slice off the arm of Annie's female Titan. He is also subsequently able to save Eren. Up until then, the female Titan was seemingly invincible since no one, irrespective of strength, gear, and experience, was able to emerge victorious against her. However, as Levi sliced up her arm, Annie herself was in absolute shock to see how a human could do this. He's mostly out of action during the second season due to a leg injury he acquired while trying to save Mikasa from Annie's Titan. His feats in Season 3 are self-explanatory, as he takes out Kenny's squad despite falling right into their trap. He later takes out Kenny as the Survey Corps had to rescue Eren from Rod Reese. This is followed by the battle at Shiganshina, where the Corps reclaimed the district. With Zeke rampaging across the area right outside Wall Maria, Levi shows off his prowess as he takes down all the pure titans around Zeke, and within mere seconds, manages to snatch Zeke out of his furry titan. In the fourth season, we see Levi being able to slice the jaw of Porco Galliard's jaw titan. He also takes out several pure titans and the beast titan within seconds once more. He then gets severely injured and somewhat handicapped, and yet goes on to fight fantastically in the final battle. The primary reason why Levi is able to pull off all these aforementioned feats is due to him being an Ackerman. He surely possesses the intent to take out his opponent, but intent alone would not cut it if his anatomy was incapable of holding up. It's kind of like singing, where a singer should primarily be able to hear whether they are on key or not. However, the hearing and pitch sensitivity alone would not allow them to pull off a song that's more complex if the voice was not trained or capable enough to execute certain actions. Levi's intent here is the singer's pitch sensitivity, while his enhanced anatomical abilities as an Ackerman mirror the singer's vocal abilities. How fast is Levi Ackerman? Is he the fastest in the series? The ODM gear amps up the speed of any human being, irrespective of whether they're an Ackerman or not. However, not everyone can handle its speed to the gear's maximum output. In Season 1, we see Mikasa being much faster than the average soldier. When agitated, she is seen expending more gas to get ahead faster. Those around her even comment on how she manages to be insanely fast. However, when Mikasa and Levi start sharing their screen time, we see that Levi is faster than Mikasa. Of course, experience is part of it, as Levi has the added experience of almost two decades in comparison to Mikasa, who is a rookie soldier in the first season. Levi also has impeccable reaction timing and speed when it comes to how, when, and where he shoots his gear. This is something that allows him to come out victorious in his fight against Kenny's squad. Throughout the action sequence, we see him using the vertical maneuvering gear at 100% of its output, which is not something anyone can pull off. But Levi also gains a fair bit of extra speed due to his unique techniques that have less to do with him being an Ackerman and more to do with Levi being Levi. For starters, we see in the No Regrets OVA that Levi has a special way of holding his dual swords. Instead of grabbing them normally, Levi uses his blades underhanded, for which he has gotten called out by a superior in the OVA. However, Levi continues to hold them the way he likes, and this exact positioning of his palms and hands is what allows him to pull off that fidget spinner turbo spin. The spin increases his kinetic energy and by extension, his strength and speed. He is also only 5 foot 3 inches. While Kenny makes fun of him for this, shorter people have a lower center of gravity which gives them better balance. This is why you'll often see shorter people as top gymnasts, strikers in football, and table tennis players. Naturally, 
Levi's greater balancing abilities allow him to sustain his speed. In fact, you'll notice how sports cars in racing have really low ground clearance. They move insanely fast and drift a lot. Their movements are similar to someone speeding and swerving on a serpent road. These cars manage to pull the speed and drift off at the same time, and what allows them to do so is the low clearance of the car, which can respond to the driver's commands very quickly. Leg and core strength also help maneuver the ODM gear better. Levi possesses immense leg and core strength because he's an Ackerman, and as such has tightened strength. While the average soldier needs to have enough strength to carry and shift their own body weight at all times, the strength of the Ackermans lets them carry things several times their own weight with little to no hassle. In one sequence, we see Mikasa carry several several steel beams to build a railway track. If she can carry something that heavy, the weight of one's own body is nothing to an Ackerman. Now that we've explained why Levi is so strong, let's bring in the comparisons. The Cart Titan and the Jaw Titan are some of the fastest Titans. Both Titans are also quadrupedal, which amps up their speed with the combined force of four limbs and a lower center of gravity. Levi went against Porco Galliard's Jaw Titan during the raid on Liberio Arc, where the Jaw was about to bite off the Attack Titan's nape and consume Eren. Levi came out of nowhere as he smoothly took out the jaw's joints, making him incapable of biting. We cannot compare the speed of a human and a titan, since they have two very different anatomies, but this movement proved that Levi is fast enough to catch a fast titan shifter off guard. The greatest display of Levi's speed was during his very first one-sided battle against Zeke's Beast Titan. Here, Levi was able to slice through Zeke's armor like a twister, taking out his eyes, foot, and eventually his nape in just a few seconds. Everything happened in the blink of an eye, and Zeke could not even react to Levi. He failed to harden his nape fast enough to block out Levi, who demolished Zeke's nape and dragged him out of his Titan with his sword. This scene proved just how incredible, unrivaled, and unmatched Levi was when it came to strength and speed. And yet, the cart appeared out of nowhere and snatched Zeke away from Levi, catching humanity strongest off guard. To be fair, we cannot answer if Levi is 100% faster than the cart or vice versa, because Levi is not fast by himself. He may be a faster runner than the average human, but he would never be able to outrun a Titan. He can match up to them in speed because of the vertical maneuvering equipment. But since his speed depends heavily on his gear, the extent of his speed is limited to the gear's output. If the gears were enhanced and made even faster, and if Levi could handle that speed, he might have given the cart a run for its money. Because the story of Attack on Titan is more plot-centric and not exactly a battle shonen, it's hard to power scale certain things because we never get to see them. Every fight and action we see happens for the sake of the story and the plot, and not necessarily for the sake of our power level understanding. What makes Levi the most durable human in all of AOT? Being an Ackerman comes with greater physical durability, and it's what allows Levi to survive multiple dangerous situations. He is not an avid user of Thunder Spears even after their creation, unlike Mikasa. Compared to her peers in the core, Mikasa is often shown standing fairly close to where the Thunder Spears are detonated. For example, we saw her stand inside the armored titan's mouth, throw the spear inside, and withstand the explosion. A non-Ackerman in her position would have had to place themselves very far away. Levi showed off his physical durability one arc before that. The Ackermans are capable of getting cuts and injuries, but during the fight in the underground chapel against Kenny's squad, Levi threw a bag of oil at Kenny who shot it. The bag exploded and Levi emerged from within the explosion unscathed. This showed us that his body could handle being near the explosion and fire. Later, he beat Zeke in the Titan Forest after Zeke turned his subordinates into pure Titans and tried to escape. Desperate to kill the monkey, Levi pinned him down with a Thunder Spear. This was meant to prevent Zeke from moving, as doing so would cause the spear to detonate. Too bad Levi never expected Zeke was the kind to sacrifice himself to take Levi out for the sake of his dream. Levi had to withstand a Thunder Spear explosion at point-blank range, and while anyone else in his place would have died, Levi survived, albeit severely injured. A part of his face was damaged and he lost the in index and middle finger of his right arm, but the rest of his body remained intact. When Hanji found him and gave him medical treatment, she mentioned how Levi was only able to survive such an explosion due to him being an Ackerman. Mikasa had her ribs broken after trying to save Eren from Bertholdt and Reiner in the last episode of Season 2. However, she quickly recovered by the beginning of Season 3, and the two episodes took place within a short time span of a few days in the AOT-verse. It is safe to say that Levi is incredibly durable, not as much as Titans who can regenerate, but very much so when compared to other humans. However, we cannot necessarily call him the most durable human being because we simply don't have concrete proof that says or shows that he is more or less durable than any of the other two Ackermans. 
Can humanity's best solo a titan army? Very much so, at least if they are pure titans. Levi solos several pure titans during his introduction, and mostly manages to take them out without getting blood on himself, since he's such a neat freak who dislikes getting dirty. He solos them during his first and second fights against Zeke. He also takes out several titans during his final battle atop Eren. Fighting titan shifters is more complicated, and although Levi can fight a shifter by himself with ease and emerge victorious, an army of titan shifters is different. In the beginning, beginning, he mentioned that if Eren did turn into the attack titan to harm them, he would kill him. He was confident enough in his strength to state that he could kill Eren's titan. We see him win against Annie's female titan as he saves both Eren and Mikasa. We see him have the upper hand against the jaw titan. We already know how terribly he has humiliated the beast titan. In the end, he also one-shots Zeke and finally kills him. If Levi has prep time, gear, and backup, he should be able to take out an army of pure titans and two titan shifters provided it's not the Colossal Titan or the Warhammer Titan. Killing the Colossal Titan is not quick business due to its steam emission abilities. In fact, Armin almost had to sacrifice himself to win against Berthold. The ideal human soldier to oppose the Colossal would be a Titan shifter using the ODM gear. Armin's method and the regeneration ability would allow them to take out the Colossal Titan and survive the ordeal. Levi cannot regenerate, so he falls into a problem if his opponent is the Colossal. Another Titan he cannot defeat is the Warhammer Titan, who remains concealed in a crystal crystallized shell and, unlike Annie, can operate from within it. Levi has nothing that can help him break the shell and he's not big enough to use the jaw titan's mouth as a nutcracker. He should be able to take out most of the other titans on a one-on-one -on -one basis or at best a two-on-one, -on -one, but too many would be a problem. Let's assume he's fighting the attack titan, the armored titan, and the cart titan. One specializes in offense, one in defense, and one in support. Levi would fail to handle their attacks with the firepower that the cart comes with. Assuming that he does manage to subdue both Eren and Rhino, with the Thunder Spears, Peak's Cart Titan can detach herself from her Titan and regenerate mid-air as many times as she wants to in order to take out an opponent. Levi might have great endurance, but he absolutely does not have the same level of endurance as the Cart. If he goes against the Jaw Titan, Female Titan, and the Beast Titan, and he's using Thunder Spears, he may be able to take them out. His speed would allow him to get to their napes with relative ease and catch them by surprise, blasting their napes off with the spear. However, it wouldn't be as easy with his swords, only because while Zeke's beast can barely do anything to stop him, the female and the jaw might be able to intervene and stop him with their kicks and speed respectively. Could Levi have defeated Eren's founding titan instead of Mikasa? We want to divide this answer into three parts, with part one being an objective answer about Levi's physical ability with respect to the question, part two being a subjective answer about the importance of character bonding, emotional state, and intent in battle, and part three being another objective answer that builds off part two, explaining why Eren's founding titan is Mikasa's duty and not Levi's. For part one, Levi has the strength to do what Mikasa did, because the final kill was not so much focused on power. The Alliance had managed to separate Eren from the source of all living matter, after which it became possible for Mikasa to get to Eren and kill him. She reached the mouth of the Founder, broke the teeth with the Thunder Spears, and sliced off Eren's nape. Levi could have done this as well. In part two, we will explain Levi's intent, his emotional nature, and the importance of this when it comes to battle while referring to characters and moments from the big three anime, namely One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach. For the record, we will not cite any examples from the newer arcs such as the Wano Country Saga, Thousand Year Blood War, or Boruto to avoid spoilers. Levi's fighting style is extremely offensive. While Eren's attack titan is known for, well, attacking, it can and does defend. Levi rarely plays defense. He just goes for the kill. This is not because he is way too motivated to kill, but he is way too motivated to not live. He has lost many people throughout his life and he's very lonely. As a result, Levi is not afraid of death. The reason he fights is because he wants to make the deaths of his comrades count. He does not want them to have died for nothing, and yet he is the only one who continues to survive. They say attack is the best defense, and that's what Levi does. He fights with many openings, but his superior abilities allow him to land his attacks before he can fall into a position from which he has to defend. He proves to be superior even among Ackermans. This strength and ability is a result of the intent Levi possesses in a fight, which itself is a result of his past experiences, emotional state, and the bond he has shared with others. Because killing Zeke was Erwin's last order to him, Levi was hellbent on killing Zeke. Erwin also died because of Zeke, so Levi had to make Erwin's death count and matter by killing Zeke. 
The way he killed the beast could have been done by Mikasa or another highly capable survey corps, since it was an injured and mildly disabled Levi who took Zeke out in an instant. But in terms of narrative and emotional buildup, it had to be Levi. We have previously mentioned how intent alone is not enough if the anatomy cannot support the intention of the fighter. However, let's contradict it here. Intent itself has a great impact on power. P.S. Because this section is subjective analysis, you're allowed to disagree with aspects of it. If you have perceived something differently or think we've skipped something, let us know in the comments section down below. In Bleach, Ichigo manages to defeat Byakuya in the Soul Society arc and Ukiora in the Arankar vs Shinigami arc because of his desire to save Rukia and Orihime, respectively. Unlike other shonen protagonists, Ichigo does not have a singular goal he charges towards. He just wants to be able to protect people, especially those he cares about. In both cases, he was on the verge of losing after a point, but his intent to save his friends and protect them aided his holification. He did lose his own consciousness for a bit, but he emerged victorious. Had that not been the case, he may not have attained his objective, especially in the battle against Ukiora. In One Piece, we see Luffy raid Impel Down to free Ace and save him from execution. However, Ace is taken to Marineford soon after and guarded by Sengoku and Garp while they bide their time until the clock strikes and Ace gets executed. His execution, however, is preponed as the war against the Whitebeard Pirates breaks out. At one point, Ace is almost beheaded, but Luffy screams from afar, commanding them to stop. The Amazon Lily arc prior to Impel Down explained that Luffy has a conqueror's hockey, but he himself is unaware of it. His desperate desire to save Ace as a result of the bond they share as adopted brothers unleashed his conqueror's hockey once again, taking out several opponents and preventing Ace's execution. This is also happening in an arc where Luffy is strong only against the fodder marines, while most of the important characters are stronger than him. From this, we can conclude that not everything is about strength, but sometimes it's about what the narrative requires and the story's progress. And finally, we have Naruto, where Naruto and Sasuke fight in all their glory after the war arc in the Valley of the End. The fight begins with Sasuke having killing intent and Naruto lacking it because Naruto does not want to kill Sasuke. He wants to save Sasuke because he knows Sasuke is lonely and doesn't want to be. Sasuke, on the other hand, realizes that he has to be alone for his goal, but since Naruto is his best friend, he will always have a bond pulling him back as long as Naruto is alive, so he must kill him. Throughout the first half of the fight, Sasuke disgustingly dominates, pulling off feats like using Naruto's hand to prevent him from using the Shadow Clone Jutsu to using those very hands to launch his own fire Ball jutsu. He also absorbs the chakra from the tail beasts he has collected, after which any attack by Naruto causes damage to Naruto himself. Sasuke explicitly mentions how if Naruto keeps playing defense, he will die. However, Naruto comes through as Sasuke charges Indra's arrow when Kurama absorbs all the nature chakra around him, and together they enter the Asura mode. Indra's arrow is tied with Naruto's attacks, and Sasuke acknowledges how Naruto has finally gained the conviction to kill him. This assessment is proven wrong, as Naruto still doesn't want to kill him, but he was also not in a position to continue playing defense, and hence, had to go all out. Failure to do so would have resulted in his death. This would also be insane, because although Kishimoto had written both characters to be equal in a way, Naruto's explosive power is higher, and yet, he would be at risk of losing the battle of explosions due to the lack of killing or attacking intent. In in all cases, the characters also share strong bonds with the people they are protecting or fighting. Levi and Eren do not share an emotional connection like that. Their dynamic and relationship are controversial to say the least. Meanwhile, Eren and Mikasa have always had a very strong bond. She became strong because of him, as she awakened her instinct to save him. The first person Eren saved as a titan was Mikasa. She spends most of the show saving him, and is willing to do anything to protect Eren and Armin. Eren and Mikasa are also deeply in love with each other, although it is not mutually acknowledged for 99% of the show. Because this is a story about freedom that began with Founder Ymir's toxic love for the king taking her freedom away, and keeping her stuck, the cycle had to end with Mikasa's selfless love choosing against her personal interest for the sake of a greater freedom. Ymir wanted to see the decision Mikasa would make, and Mikasa, unlike Ymir, decided to give up on her love to not just save the world for her sake, but because she realized that is how Eren mapped things out to be. He wanted her to kill him, so that his friends could be seen as if not heroes, at least good people who fought to save the world, and live out their lives without having to worry about war. Levi might be a terrific character, but he is still a side character. In any story, the final conclusions are brought in by the main cast. With Eren in the center, it had to be Mikasa and not Levi. Marvelous Verdict Although Levi does not conclude the story, he reaches a fantastic conclusion as he fulfills his duty to its very end and salutes his fallen comrades. From the very beginning to the very end, 
Levi's character has seen great moments, great hype, great development, great character dynamics, great voice acting, insanely expensive animation, and finally, it has given us great emotional payoff. For things to go this far with him, however, Levi had to be as strong as he is. He had to be able to do the things he did, and for that, we can thank both his lineage and his anatomy. And with that, today's video comes to an end. What do you think of Levi Ackerman's anatomy? Did you enjoy this video? Let us know in the comments section down below, and until next time, thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.